Oh, hey, you're here. Since you're already here, let me tell you what I think about the recent Fleet Foxes album. Sure, this is the first All 77 review. So like most people, I became aware of the Fleet Foxes around 2008 when they had their surprise, pastoral, folkish hit, White Winter Hymnal. I knew that they were signed to Sub Pop Records, which was a bit of a surprise at the time, and they were compared to bands like Crosby, Stills and Nash and Joni Mitchell. So I just assumed that they were the new breed of indie folk that was very popular on the airwaves and television at the time. In many ways, I was very wrong. What the Fleet Foxes really remind me of is, well, Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys circa 1971, 1973, albums like uh, Holland, uh, Surf's Up, the more experimental Beach Boys album, basically the ones on which the Beach Boys decided to give Brian Wilson another shot at taking the reins of the band, obviously inspired by Smile, their 1967 album that never was. Instead, obviously, they released Pet Sounds. But back to the Fleet Foxes. This is the group they most remind me of, and once I got to listen to them closely, it was clear that they were far ahead of the bands that were also very popular around 2008. Of course, I'm talking about bands like the Lumineers, uh, Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros, bands that had bona fide hits, uh, what I'd like to call stadium folk. Fleet Fox's career trajectory has been very odd indeed. This is their fourth album. Ah, about their fourth album. And a lot has happened since they last released music. Of course, their, their first two albums, uh, the, their self-titled and the Helplessness Blues, uh, really introduced them to the world and really made them very popular. But soon afterwards, they, they pretty much folded and disappeared. Of course, they lost their drummer and not necessarily an integral part in their sound, but uh, Father John Misty, or as he was then called Josh Tillerman, left the band to pursue a solo project which in many ways ended up eclipsing what the Fleet Foxes have managed to do for themselves. In that time also bands like I mentioned the Lumineers and, and groups like that ended up having a lot of hits, ended up being used in a lot of marketing campaigns and it did seem like the Fleet Foxes would just be a speck on the late 2000s music. This is their fourth album and it's a much more casual affair. This is actually the most surprising thing about the record. Okay, so what has changed since their last album, Crack Up? Well, a lot has changed in terms of tone and style. Obviously, what the Fleet Foxes are best known for are the vocal harmonies, uh, the layered parts, um, the instrumentation, usually reliant on acoustic guitars, but not solely that, they do have uh, percussion, so, you know, in a way I was actually surprised to learn that uh, Fleet Fox's drummer, Josh Tillerman, had left the band when it did happen. I, my first thought was, wait, Fleet Foxes have a drummer? But they do, they actually contribute with a lot of sounds, a lot of small sounds that add to the soundscape. By the time of their third album, Crack Up, they really went into a direction that many described as progish. Really what happened is that their, their songs just grew in complexity and the lyrics became even more obscure, uh, less uh, easy to, to pin down and to understand. But this is not the case with Shore and in many ways it's their most agreeable album, uh, the most easy to get into. And uh, what I think this owes a lot to is their age and their maturity and the fact that in, in many ways it looked like a long shot that the Fleet Foxes would make another album at all. So what kind of songs are you going to find on this new album by, by Fleet Foxes? Well, if I were to give a, a, a very brief uh, description, it would be Fleet Foxes, like you've heard them on the first two records, but not as hopeless, not as pessimistic or as mysterious, but it's a, it's a lighter version of the band, but not necessarily a more commercial one. I would say, in a way, it's a more childish, uh, easygoing version of the band. For the first two uh, songs, for example, Waiting in a Waste High Water and Sun, uh, Sunblind, uh, they find the band trading in the same 
gorgeous melodies that inform Robin Peckinol's songwriting. And obviously it was this sound that has uh, garnered them the most attention and has gathered the most imitators. Obviously when the Fleet Foxes appeared on the scene they were compared to groups like Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young that made big use of vocal harmonies. And even the melodies in themselves, as, as odd as they seemed for the time, maybe they, they had something in common with Carol King or with Joni Mitchell. But in time they've drawn inwards and uh, this has created a sound that is very unique. In a way that's the big selling point of record. Although it is more of a pop, folkish record by Fleet Foxes standards, it's very much their sound and even though they have so many imitators, uh, nobody can really produce what they do on a good day. Can I Believe You in many ways is the golden standard of the record. It trades in those familiar gorgeous melodies. Um, it's sun-hissed and has many of the ingredients that make Fleet Foxes songs great and in many ways it is the top song on the album. It's both uh, emotionally desolate and grandiose, layered in harmonies. It's a sort of world-traveled, um, slightly bitter song. For a week or two sounds almost like a folk gospel, which wouldn't be out of place with uh, previous Flea Foxes recordings or of what we know of their beliefs and, uh, uh, and their, their principles. But then again there is Young Man's Game, which in, in a way is the most uh, pop-centric song the Fleet Foxes have ever recorded. I think this was actually the first, uh, the first one I heard because when the album did come out it was, uh, it was announced on a lot of platforms. Obviously things like Spotify had uh, uh, ample uh, uh, commercial appeal there. Um, but this was the song I, I first heard in, in a way, it's their most accessible tune. Of course, some would say that maybe the band has sold out or they're trying to go for uh, a sound that might garner them hits. But that's not really the case if you've heard uh, any of the other big indie folk bands uh, in, in recent times. It's not that sound of uh, that, that joyous, uh, harmonious, uh, rhythmic sound. It's still a personal sound. But I think the only thing that has changed is that the group and Robin Peckinold especially, the songwriter, is just less troubled, probably, less troubled in his life and uh, by his music career. In a way, it's a sound of acceptance. There's also a hint of Baroque pop, um, a sound that a lot of artists has, have explored recently and certainly the Fleet Foxes may have had an influence on that as well. One of the best songs on the album, Cradling Mother, Cradling Women, is typical of Fleet Foxes inspiration in uh, taking inspiration from from poetry as well as beautiful melodies and they what what I've always remarked about the band is that they have this this way of uh, easing into songs of uh, letting songs flow of not worrying about fitting into a three to five minute uh, commercial standard and this is definitely something that's very appealing here as well and the, the, final, the final song on the album that I would definitely recommend is actually the title song, it's uh, sure. And in a review that I did for Alt 77, which I'll actually link in the description below, uh, I call this uh, a song that Bernie Chopin and Elton John could have easily written at the end of the best uh, or the worst year in their uh, uh, collective history. It's, um, there's a weight behind the Fleet Foxes music that is impossible to copy and I think that's the thing that uh, everyone that did try to steal from them didn't really get it. Of course the harmonies they're so beautiful as well as, as the melodies that you'd get why a band like this would be so appealing. But there's a uh, nostalgia to them and a sadness to them that makes it, for me at least, and I have the same experience with Brian Wilson's music, it makes it almost uncomfortable to listen to. It's a confessional kind of music but one that's very, very layered, very, um, you know, it, it, it's delivered after a lot of work has been put into it, let's put it that way. I can't really say uh, all the same about the Fleet Foxes contemporaries. So what's the conclusion? So, even though Shore is the most accessible Fleet Foxes record, and even though perhaps it's the least appealing for me, out of the four albums they've released so far, 
uh, I would definitely recommend uh, hearing it and I'd actually recommend listening to it a few times. It's a one album you, you'll probably come back to and one album that's going to serve a lot in the discography and the myth of the Fit Foxes. In fact, if they hadn't put this album out, I don't know exactly what their, you know, their part in, uh, in, in modern history of music would be. It'd be something of an oddity. It'd be this band that was signed to Sub Pop, the record, that, record label that's most famous for Nirvana, and they delivered this weird Baroque folk, and then they just disappeared. But this is not the case. They've actually come back. Uh, they seem more level-headed. They're just as uninterested in uh, media trappings as they've always been. And delivering this record as easy to get into it as it is, it still shows that they had something inherently more special than all the other artists that um, you know carved a career for themselves with a similar sound and probably taking direct inspiration from Robin Pecknold. My verdict is that even though this is not the kind of music I would listen to every day, personally, it's, it, it's something I check out once in a while because it's, it's beautiful but almost uncomfortable to listen to. I think this is one of the most unique voices of recent decades. And this is what this album proves. If I were to give it a, a great, as we often need to, I'd give it a B+. Plus. It's a great album. No one else could make it, and in an age where everybody is doing this retro styling just to please algorithms and to get on Spotify playlists, Fleet Foxes are beyond any algorithm and beyond the clear categorization. So, calling them a folk band eh, is almost doing them an injustice. Great record. An oddity and a gem. Okay, that's my review. Get out of here.